Well, good morning. Hey, it's great to see all of you here. And, and what, if you want to know what the Valley Church is all about, you just experienced it. You just experienced it. That, that was happening here. It's happening at the Troy campus. And uh, I, I just have really sensed and seen a move of God, not only in the Valley Church, but in our world. And you may get see the, 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 the news, and, and, and you may hear things, and you may see the sort of the, the dysfunction sometimes of our culture, but I want you to know God is moving in people's lives right now. He's, he's claiming a people for his own. He's changing lives. It's just great to get to be a part of that. I hope you'll have the hope of knowing that. I hope you will. Well, I'm Andy Mon, one of the pastors here at the Valley, and uh, just great to be with you. You know, we've been on a journey uh, in a, with a sermon series called Appointment in Jerusalem, and it uh, looks like I lost my screen there. There it is. It's on the screen behind me. Yes, you know, when we go through these sermon series, sometimes they become almost like old friends. Uh, have you, uh, I, I don't know if that's how you've experienced this one, but for me, that's kind of how it's been. It's almost like when you go on vacation for seven days and the sixth day you start to grieve. <laughs> You got to go back to work, you know, or you got to go go back to the reality, and uh, you start. That's kind of how when we come to the end of some of these sermon series, it's almost like no, I've 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 so enjoyed this. I don't want the book to end. I don't want the vacation to end. I don't want this series to go. And, and yet, there's another one coming. And uh, you know, sometimes we would have ended the series by now, because we often have experienced a lot of the Easter story. You know the. The, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and then Jesus' appointment with the cross, and, and then this, the, the empty tomb. And we would have experienced all that, and we would have moved on to the next series. But what's fascinating is that there's a story that sometimes we just move right uh, over, and it's a story um, of two people on a road away from Jerusalem. It's the rest of the story. Now, what's fascinating is sometimes we wonder, now why is that story there? I thought the climax was Jesus coming out of the tomb. What, what, what's the deal? What's this story there for? Uh, Tim Keller tells a story. Um, he actually watched a movie called The Sixth Sense. Anybody here seen it? Well, I'm going to give it away, so if you haven't, sorry. Okay, so Bruce Willis is the main character in Sixth Sense, and uh, he's, he plays a child psychologist, and he's working with this kid, and he's dead, but he doesn't know it. And so the child eventually tells him that he's one of the dead people, and, and when you go through the whole, the, the whole movie, you don't really recognize till you understand that that something's weird. And when you go back and then you watch the movie a second time, you begin to realize that Bruce Willis and the interactions he has with his wife, she never really, she never talks to him. She never interacts with them or with anybody else. Bruce never really has any connection or any conversation with anybody else in the movie, but you don't recognize that. It's kind of hidden from you until you go back and you watch the whole thing again. That's really what's happening in this story. That's what's happening on the road to Emmaus. So I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. We're going to dive into this story, and I want you to understand that this story this, this event that happens, this encounter is really a way for us to view the resurrection and the cross. It's really a way for us to understand what does it all mean. And so turn with me, Luke chapter 24. By the way, the, the two on the road to Emmaus that we're going to be talking about here, those two, they've experienced uh, the, 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 uh, the empty tomb, that Jesus has risen. In fact, some women came and told the disciples, hey, He's risen. He's not there. And, 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 and these angels, they told us that he had risen and wasn't there. And you know what their response was? I don't believe it. That's nonsense. Because it wasn't what they'd expected. And often we dismiss things that we don't expect. Did you know that Pearl Harbor didn't have to happen the way it was? They had just installed on the end of the islands chain, they had installed this new thing called radar. And they were watching, they had three people that were watching the approach where the Japanese planes came. And, and, and they dismissed it. They, they saw the radar signature. They called, the, they called those who were in command, and they told them what they had seen, and they dismissed it. They said, it must, that, there's no way that couldn't happen. And, and they blew it off, and they could have scrambled the planes, and it wouldn't have happened the way that it went down. But they just couldn't get their head around it, that it could have, it could have 
It could be happening. And some of us don't understand what God wants to do in our life, and so we dismiss him as Lord and Savior. And that's really what's happening here. God wants us to understand how we're to view the resurrection, how we're to view the cross, what he's come to do, and how he wants to live in our life today. Luke chapter 24. It said, now that same day, by the way, this is the same day that Jesus has risen from the dead. So later on during that day, it says two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. So they're kind of commiserating. They're not just commiserating, but they're like trying to figure it out. They're wrestling with just what happened. All of us need to wrestle with what happened when Jesus died on the cross. We need to wrestle with what, what it means that, that the tomb is empty. What does that mean for you and me? And what what, what, help me understand that in light of my life today. And it says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. This is the first time that Luke, who's recording all these events as one of the gospel writers, there are four gospel writers, he's given one view, one perspective on that whole thing, and, and it's the first time he introduces Jesus after he has risen from the dead. And so we get our first glimpse of the, of the risen Jesus. And he, he just comes sort of, it almost feels nonchalant. It feels like it just, he just starts to walk beside him. Now we understand that one of the guy's names is Cleopas. We don't know who the other one is, if it's a male or a female, whoever it is, but they're, they're whoever it is, both of them, the, the, the wind has been taken out of their sails. Like their hope has been crushed. They really thought Jesus was the Messiah. They thought he was the one who was supposed to come and, and, and save them, the Jewish people, from all the oppression that they were experiencing, from all the difficult moments that were about to come. They had a certain vision for what the Messiah was coming to do, and now he is dead. And so they're rehashing this for the umpteenth time. They're trying to really figure it out. And Jesus comes upon them. But what's really fascinating to me is that they can't see him. <laughs> They don't see who he is. And obviously, they had, they had been there. They had seen who Jesus was, but they were kept from recognizing Jesus. I, I, I find that fascinating. Do you ever wonder why you can't see Jesus better? Do you, you ever wonder why sometimes we, we, we wonder, why, God, didn't you just send him in a physical form? You, you did then, but why not now? Why, why, why is it so hard sometimes to see you and all the things that are happening around us? Why don't you make him more visible, God? He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and and all the people. I want you to see this. Don't miss this. Before they called him Messiah, the Christ, which means Savior. Like he was the one that God had promised to come and save his people from their sins. But guess what? Now that he died on the cross, they downgrade him. He's only a prophet. Uh, He's, he's not Messiah anymore. They don't see him. And certainly if he can't save himself, how can we call him Messiah? How can we call him Savior? And isn't that what we do? You see, in the moments when we're excited and all is going well and, and God reveals himself to us and we say yes to him, we start this journey with him, but then things can get difficult. I think Candace's testimony is all of our testimony. There comes a moment in time we say, God, are you really God? And I'm angry with you. You saw this. You could have stopped it. Why didn't you? Why didn't you heal my dad? Why why didn't you keep that destructive thing from happening in my life? Why don't you pull me out of this? And in those moments, we take him from Savior and we move him down to prophet or teacher or maybe some good moral thing, but not Messiah and king because he didn't wipe the difficulty out that we thought he should and we don't see jesus as he really is that's what's happened here it says the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him but we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem israel that 
they, they really thought that, that the kingdom of God was going to be put on earth right then and there. It, the best way, uh, I don't know, just an illustration for us is I, I just think, remember when ISIS a couple years ago was trying to establish this caliphate or whatever thing was, a religious an institutional sort of movement in Syria and Iraq and all those areas. You, you remember, it was all in the news every night, this caliphate, they were taking over territory. They were trying to create this Muslim religious political system that would, that would just take over. That's really what the Jewish people thought Jesus had come to do. Like he was going to sit on the throne, not just, not just this throne in our heart, but he was going to sit on the throne in real in, in, the, in the world we can see. Like he was going to kill the Roman oppression. He was going to put that, that, like they were going to be out of power. Like he was going to come and he was going to fix all the corruption in the Jewish religious system. Like he was going to reign here on earth. That's what they were looking for. And they didn't get it. But that's what they had expected. So when it didn't happen, what happens when something happens that we don't expect? That, that it doesn't work out the way we think it ought to, we dismiss it. And, and that's really what these disciples have done. They've dismissed it. It says, and what is more, they go on to Jesus, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not, oh, you didn't give you it on the screen. They did not see Jesus. They didn't see Jesus because they thought they should see him physically. But God was doing something else. And look what Jesus says to him. He says, how foolish you are. Foolish, by the way, this isn't just, eh, you got no common sense. No, this is, a, this is a willful, sinful kind of a, you're thinking the wrong way in a, in a sinful way. You're missing the mark on how to think about this. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Because he said, the signs were all there. You just chose not to see them the way you wanted to. You, you chose to see them the way you wanted to see them, not the way... I laid him out for you. Did not the Messiah have to suffer all these things and then enter his glory? Certainly, Jesus had told the apostles all the way along for three years, I've got to die on the cross and rise from the dead to pay the cost of your sins. That's what I came to do. And Peter says, shh, quit talking that way. The disciples like, no, they, I mean, he told them plainly that was coming and they dismissed it because they had another vision for what God ought to do. I just want you to know today, if you don't have... The, the right view of who Jesus is, you will dismiss what he wants to do in your life in those difficult moments. Because you'd be like, no, that's, that's not the God that I want in my life. That's not what he ought to be doing. That's not how he ought to act. That's not the rule and reign that he, that, that he should be doing. And we'll, we won't see Jesus. They were missing Jesus. And it says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets who explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. That's always fascinating to me. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly, or is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. It says, then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? Just when they finally see him, he disappeared. Their eyes are opened. They see who Jesus is. Gone. Now you see him, now you don't. <laughs> Jesus, God does have a sense of humor. I, I really. It said, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So they went all the way to Emmaus, now all the way back, running back to tell the disciples what they had seen. Then they found the 11, not 12 disciples anymore, because one has betrayed Jesus, Judas. He is no more. And those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them by them when he broke the bread. 
This story isn't here by accident. It's not an aside. It's not the appendix to the story of what Jesus did on the cross and rising from the dead. It is rather the lens by which we are to view the cross, by which we are to view Jesus rising from the dead. It is the lens Jesus wants us to understand who he is. And and I think there are three things we can pull out of this. When you can't see Jesus, look to the scriptures. When you can't see Jesus, he wants them to know, look to the scriptures. After all, what does he say? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, that is Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. By the way, the, all the prophets and, and Moses and all the prophets, that's a shorthand for the Old Testament. That's what they had up to, those were the scriptures that they had up to that day. And what does Jesus do but takes them back to the Old Testament, he takes them back to Moses and the prophets where it was foretold that Jesus would come, that he was the Messiah, that he would fulfill all these prophecies that God had put, all these promises that God had put in place. He would keep the covenant. He would be the new covenant and over and over and over and Jesus points them to that and says hey if you don't know who I am look to the scriptures and he certainly took them back to Genesis where it highlights that a descendant of Eve would be the one who would crush the serpent Satan his name would be Jesus it shows us over and over I'm sure he took them back to Noah's Ark where Noah's Ark showed that there was going to be a judgment on earth but but that there was a rescue plan, that God was coming to rescue, and only he could provide the rescue. I'm certain he told the story of Abraham and Isaac when Isaac's son carried the firewood on his back up the mountain where he was, a tree, essentially, where he was to be sacrificed, just as Jesus was to carry his cross and be sacrificed. And how the whole sacrificial system of cows and sheep would provide a temporary sacrifice, but how Jesus was the one who would provide the all-time permanent sacrifice because he was the perfect sacrifice. And the list goes on and on, and Jesus pointed all these out and said, these point to me, and I'm the one who fulfilled that. I want you to know we get to know him when we dive into the scriptures. When we can't see Jesus, look to the scriptures. Because that's how God reveals him to us in our time and in our day and in our age. And we got to see him for who he really is. We have to be, let him be Lord and King. We have to let him do things the way he's going to do them. Because you know what? Ultimately, he's good and he's God. And he has our best interest at heart even when things don't go the way we think they ought to. When you don't see Jesus, look to the scriptures. I think there's something else we see here is that you can't see Jesus until you break bread with him. What do you mean by that? What's fascinating is, the, is, is right before the crucifixion and right before he rises from the dead, what, what happens before that? There's this thing called the Last Supper. He's sitting at a table. He institutes communion, this, this, this time of connection with God, remembering his sacrifice, but it's more than just remembering what he did on the cross. It's about relationship. The table always was about relationship. And so what happens right sandwiched or, or, or bookending what happened in the middle? Now there's another table experience. It's Jesus sitting at the table with them. And you know what? The table always symbol, symbolized relationship. And I, I love what it said there. It says when he was at the table with them, He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. If you want to see Jesus, you're going to have to be in relationship with him. I used to think when I was a kid that God was so big, like he'd started this whole thing, kind of spun it in motion, and then was watching from a distance. That, that was my view of who God was. I wonder how many here have that same view of God. And he's over there, and I'll do my thing, and, and hopefully he'll, he'll, he'll take care of me at the end. And, and that's where I was at for a long time until I began to realize, no, God wants to live in my heart. He wants to live with me. He wants to do life with me. He wants to sit at the table like he wants to be my friend. And, and, and there were spiritual things I just didn't get. Anybody else? There were spiritual things I just didn't understand. And that's what's happening here. 
these two people on the road, they knew about Jesus, but they didn't know him. And the question is, do you know him today? Do, no doesn't, doesn't mean, oh, I understand a few facts about him, or, or I've decided I'm going to learn more about him. No, know him means I've got this connection with him. I've got this relationship with him. I'm like, like we're going to do life together, and I'm committed to do that. As Fred said, I'm all in. That's when their eyes were opened. When, cause, cause, see, Jesus was taken off. Like he was going to keep going. He's walking with them, but like they're going to stop for dinner and hang out. And Jesus keeps going. And, and I, I, I thought, is this a game Jesus is playing? What's going on there? I think he was going to keep going. He was waiting for them to say, No, I want you to be in my life. I want you to stay. I want to understand who you are, Jesus. And you and I, we got the same decision to make. And, and here's so, this is so critical. This is what Paul tells the church in Corinth. He said, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. See, when you say yes to Jesus, when you want to do table fellowship with him, when you want to do a relationship with him and go through this life with him, then he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers you, who guides you, who speaks to you, who lives inside of you. He's another person of God who is with you. When you have this Holy Spirit in you, you also have Jesus in you. They are one and the same God. Mystery, I know. But some, some of us have walked and we've just decided to do this thing with our own understanding, with our with our own thoughts. But God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my way is higher than your ways. You aren't going to figure it out. And they weren't figuring it out. They didn't understand, even though he had plainly told them because they hadn't yet committed to him. But now, they say, I want, I want to do life with you. Show me. And it begins to reveal. So some of you today need to make that decision. I'm going to weigh the evidence and here's always the deal. Chicken or egg, right? Like, I need to know how it's all going to come out, how everything is. I need to understand it all before I trust in you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I've given you an intelligent faith. I've given you prophecy. I foretold hundreds of events that, that point only to me. And, and if just 10 of those came true, you could stack silver dollars in the state of Texas, two foot high, cover the whole thing, and, and you could only pick, you'd have to find that one. Just, there are hundreds. It takes more faith not to believe Jesus is who he says he is, who God created. He made a very specific pointer to Jesus in all of time to be the Savior of the world, to be the Messiah. It would take more faith not to believe that by far. And then when you look at Scripture, how it's all woven together, 66 books over hundreds and thousands of years, and, and there's one author, and it all, how does that happen? There's a God who is writing it all. And then Jesus dies on a cross, and he rises from the dead. Like, how do you know that's real? Because there were hundreds of eyewitnesses who saw Jesus, and they saw him die, and then they saw him rise from the dead. Hundreds. Why does that all recorded in the scriptures is historical fact so you can know that you know that you know that Jesus is real. That he is the one who was to come. He is God and you don't have to question that. And then it says, hey, you're without excuse because you can look at nature and you can know there's a God who created all this. And where we have to come to the place is, you know what, God, you've given me so much evidence that I'm going to I'm going to trust you, Jesus. I'm going to trust that you are the Messiah. You've revealed that's who you are. And I'm going to trust in you. And now you're going to open up to me all the other things that I don't understand. See, if you don't begin to walk, you'll never get there. It's all about a quest. It really is all about a quest. And we only find Jesus when we really want to find him. What I find fascinating is these two 
people on the road, Cleopas and his companion, whoever that was, like they were wrestling over what the scriptures meant. They were wrestling over what the events meant. They were trying to figure it out. That's when Jesus comes to them, begins to talk to them. Until, until you really want to know who Jesus is, until you really want to know what his plan is for your life, you probably won't ever discover it. Because see, the reality is truth isn't something we figure out. It's revealed by a loving father who created a world to work in a lot different ways than humanly speaking we can understand. Jesus has always been a teacher of the disciples, but now we see these two disciples not just being spoon-fed, but like they're searching it out, they're seeking it out. And, and that's a question for all of us today. How much do we want to know Jesus? See, until we want to know him more than we want to breathe itself, we aren't going to know him. Because look what Jesus says. He says, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will will be open to you. And until you want him that much, you're probably not going to find him. That's the lens that Jesus wants you to look at what the cross meant and what the resurrection was. Because otherwise you're going to miss him. And you're going to say, I'm angry. Just like Candace did. Just like I've done in my life. Like most of us have done at some point or another, God, you should have done it this way. Why would you allow that in my life? And not trust him that he's doing something that he can only do in the pain and the suffering that maybe we're going through. He doesn't cause it, but he allows it for good. And so we see, you can't be Messiah because you didn't rescue me from that. You can't be the Savior because you would have certainly not let that happen in my life. And Jesus says, do you trust me? Do you trust me? There is coming a day when the kingdom of God will come on this earth and will come to heaven and we'll, we'll experience total goodness. There will be no more pain or suffering. That order of things is passing away. But on this life, your character is what matters to me. You trusting in me as your lifeline is what matters to me. I want you to trust in me. I want you to do this journey with me and I want to have a relationship with you and I want to do it here in these difficult moments because if you trust me here, then I'll know you truly love me. And so the question today is, are you on a quest for God? You, many of you, you have been baptized today. Again, there were another seven or eight in, in Troy. There are 20 people being baptized today. And, and the Bible says that, that we're to repent and be baptized. We're to, we're to turn to Jesus, and we're to say yes to him, and when he comes into our life, an outward expression of that is to be baptized. To, to glorify God is really what it's about. Every time somebody's baptized, it's not just about our testimony. We, it, it is part of that, but the testimony is really to point to God and say, look what he's done. He changed another life. How good, how good he is. How, how awesome he is. How powerful he is. How loving he is. He is. That's what baptism is all about. And, and after we say yes to Jesus, the next act of obedience is to be baptized. Some did it right away. Others take time. But the reality is that's the next step. But I want you to know there's always a next step. There's always another step. And those disciples who were walking to Emmaus, they, they, they were trying to figure it out. They were taking their next step. And, and, and so you're not done when you're baptized. You just have started. So are you on a quest? Have you experienced Jesus as King and Lord so you can truly see him? Because you'll never really see him unless you say, God, I give it all to you. I'm going to trust my life with you. And if you choose to do something or allow something difficult in my life, I'm not going to be angry with you. I'm not going to hate, hate you. I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to believe that you're doing it for my good. And I'm going to sit with you. And I'm going to look for you in the scriptures. And I'm going to let you walk with me through it. And, and I'm going to believe that when we come out the other end, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be more like you. I, I love this promise. This isn't just a command. This is a promise in Romans chapter 12, 
1 and 2. It says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now watch this. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's when you see Jesus. When you say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to do it your way. That's really what the Emmaus Road was all about. It's seeing Jesus didn't come to do it our way, he came to do it his way. And he ultimately loves you. And you can see all the way through scriptures that he wants to have a relationship with you and he wants to bring you to a, a place where you become all that he created you to be. So how do you view the cross? How, how do you view the resurrection? Have you sat down at the table with him and begun a relationship with him that's a relationship of trust, no matter what's happening in your life? That is what God came to do. And that's who Jesus is. And when you do that, you'll see him. Let's pray. Father, I just, I thank you that you put this passage there so that we, we could understand what you came to do. Not in the way we want to understand it, not in the way the disciples understood it, but in the way you want us to see it so that we truly see you for who you are, so that we don't get angry when it doesn't go the way we want it to go. We don't get despondent, but we realize that you love us, that you have a great plan for us, and you're creating in us a character that won't burn off when we go to heaven, but it'll be a character of gold. It, it'll be a mind and a heart that follows you. Jesus, thank you that you love us enough not to give us the easy route, that you love us enough that you are there, that you are our Savior, that you are the Messiah, you are the one who was to come, and you walk with us. We're never alone. Thank you for who you are. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. So what do you do with this? Maybe for some of you, you begin, it's time to sit down with Jesus and make that decision. You've got enough evidence. There's plenty of evidence. Have you said yes to him? Have you weighed the evidence and said, I trust that you're the Messiah? Because until you do, you aren't going to see Jesus. Have some of you maybe begin to read Scripture chapter a day? Like, what is God saying to them, and what is he saying to me, and what does he want me to do? What does he want me to be? Have you really started to dive in because you want to see Jesus, you've got to turn to the scriptures. And, and it's helpful to be on the road with other people to talk about these things, to wrestle together. Are you in a life group? Are you doing a journey study? Maybe sign up for the journey study and begin this journey with Jesus, with somebody else alongside of you to help you understand what God wants to do in your life. See, otherwise you're going to miss. You're going to miss the Jesus who wants to be your friend who wants to be your savior, and you're going to dismiss him, and you're going to miss what God wants to do. That's why you have the lens. Next week, we start a series called The Table. I find it so fascinating that the Last Supper was at a table, Jesus with the disciples, an intimate relationship, connection, doing life together, and he, right after the cross of resurrection, back to another table. Jesus did a lot of amazing things at a table, and he wants to sit at the table with us. And so we're going to have four conversations. We're going to look at four conversations Jesus had at tables. That's the next series. I can't wait to get started. Please invite a friend. Bring somebody with you. Plenty of these on your seats. I want you to pray over the series, and I want you to invite somebody because I, I believe this series is going to be a, a series that will change people's lives, including ours. God bless you. Go and see Jesus.